Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We are moving on um, to the evolution and natural selection PowerPoint today. And I'm going to break this up into a few different videos. Um, and the but before we get into it, I wanted to just show you again, remind you that there's notes at the bottom um, of these slides, especially because in the first PowerPoint, they really weren't all that dense. But as you move forward, you'll see that I add um, pretty significant um, outlines for each slide with the most important information. This is a great place to get um, uh, to study from for your exams, your quizzes. I also will include extra resources and insights and things that I'm citing in each slide at the bottom of these. So if you want to check my work, if you want to learn more, you can actually look at those resources in the bottom of the slide. Um, I really uh, pride myself on providing you objective scientific consensus data. Um, so I'm, I'm almost never giving you my opinion, personal opinion. Um, I am going to provide the evidence you know, that is current. So I'll include that at the bottom of the slides. With that being said, let's jump into part one of our evolution by way of natural selection. So this classic image, right, um, evolution by way of natural selection, where you have kind of the ape walking towards, so this is a funny meme. I'll, I'll try to incorporate, you know, stupid inappropriate jokes throughout this semester to make you laugh. Number one, this is the first one. Um, you know, this is um, oftentimes, you know, very controversial among the anthropological community because it's really not as simple as this, right? But we're going to explore that over the course of the semester. So before we move into um, the first section that I'm going to introduce you to in this lecture series is going to be the scientific method and um, how that applies to early evolutionary theory. We're not going to go crazy into the scientific method. I'm sure you're familiar with it, um, but I do want to stress the importance of it as we move forward. And so this is kind of the basic outline of the scientific method. You have a question, right? A scientific question, a question that can be answered scientifically. Um, and you do a little background research. You want to understand, um, you know, what's already been done. What do we already know about this particular problem? Um, so let's take a kind of basic question like, you know, why the lights didn't turn on when I walked into the house? Um, you know, back, you know, back, the first thing you might do, you're flipping that switch, right? You might jump on Google, what's going on? Um, and the background research will say, okay, well, it's probably a blown light bulb, a blown fuse, right? It's going to give you um, a series of, of things that have already been discovered about this particular topic. You'll use that information to then construct a hypothesis or your best educated guess as to what is going on. And so my first educated guess, if my lights weren't working, is, well, probably the light bulb blew. And so um, I'm going to test that with an experiment. And what my experiment is going to do is I'm going to unplug the or unscrew the old light bulb, put in a new light bulb. Now, then I'll analyze the results. Is my hypothesis correct? Well, if the lights turn on, then it is, right? And then I can report those results. Now, nobody's interested in my light bulb uh, test, right? But you get where I'm going with this. Um, now, let's say that my hypothesis is wrong. I put in that new light bulb. It's not working, right? So now I have to move on. I go back and I look for a new hypothesis. Okay, well, maybe a fuse blew. So now my experiment is check the fuse, go outside, do that, switch it out, right? If that hypothesis is true, the lights will turn on. If it's not, right, then I'm going to move, go backwards again and, and keep looking until I find what the actual explanation is. Um, now, this is obviously a very basic idea of the scientific method. Once it's this, you know, this is a real published study. Um, really, what we're doing is we are trying to um, get that information out so that it can be peer reviewed. When you do assignments in this class, I am going to explain expect you to use peer-reviewed scholarly research. So not websites, not encyclopedias, right? No Wikipedia ever, please. Um, but uh, peer-reviewed resources. And the reason why this is so important to the scientific method is that, you know, really anybody can publish anything, right? And um, especially with books. So you have to be careful with that in this day and age. Books can be published on Amazon for 99 cents, right? Or for even for free sometimes. Um, and so you can't trust what a person has self-published um, or even what general publishing companies publish. But peer-reviewed journals require that, um, you know, you submit what you want to uh, publish and that experts in that field review it, right? They're your peers in that field. They're reviewing it um, for accuracy. They're going to look at your 
techniques, they're going to look at your measurements, and they're probably going to challenge you on a whole host of things and make you edit and edit and edit before you can um, actually publish this piece of evidence. And the idea behind that is to ensure that the most accurate information is being disseminated in the scientific community and that we have reduced as much as possible personal bias. So we don't wanna cherry pick data. We don't want to present um, scholarly work that is fraudulent. Um, that can be quite dangerous. We saw that and we will investigate that with an example of vaccines. Um, a doctor named Andrew Wakefield um, you know, squeezed through and published an article about vaccines um, causing autism. Um, once it was more heavily peer reviewed, we found that the data was falsified. Um, this guy lost his medical license, he can no longer practice, and he certainly is not publishing in any um, reputable scientific journals in the world today. Um, there was also a huge danger um, in what he proposed, right? He created an anti-vaccination movement that has effectively caused certain diseases to, or he, sub he substantiated um, an anti-vaccination movement and probably increased its size, um, which led to certain diseases re-emerging like measles um, and becoming more common in, in the general population again. So this is just the danger of, of, of a lack of peer review process. Now, of course there's greed, of course there is um, you know, corruption in the science world, just like there is everywhere else in the world, which is why we have to, as individuals, be able to critically think. We have to be able to read and look at what we're reading and hear what we're listening to and question it. And I hope that you do that throughout the semester. Always ask me questions. Always tell me when something doesn't line up because I don't want you to just blindly listen to me as an authority figure. I want you to understand that, um, you know, while we do the best as we possibly can in the scientific disciplines to be objective, to present objective, unbiased information, that there's oftentimes going to be caveats where that's not the case. And so we have to be able to find those on our own. So what are the rules of the scientific method in general? Well, first, evidence must be what we call empirically observable. You have to be able to observe it with your senses. We have to be able to measure it. Um, and so we want to, you know, and of course, we can't always, uh, we don't have the most advanced senses. Um, you know, dogs can smell millions of times more things than we can smell, for instance. And so we have developed all sorts of technology that can see things we can't see and hear things we can't hear and smell things we can't smell. Um, and as long as it is measurable to some degree, then we can study it from a scientific perspective. Scientific answers are bounded. So the answer to the light bulb question is bounded by laws, right? Laws of physics um, and things like that. So for instance, the reason that my light bulb isn't working when I walk into the house has nothing to do with the fact that, you know, somebody ordered a cheeseburger in Taiwan three hours ago. Those things are unbounded. They're unrelated to each other, right? Um, now, when you look at more religious explanations for life, you'll find that they are unbounded. For instance, the reason that person in Taiwan ordered a cheeseburger and the reason that my light isn't working could easily be explained by God, right? God wanted both of them. Um, those things to happen, that's God's plan, right? And so that's an unbounded answer. That is something that cannot be tested scientifically because each a uh, scientific question is bounded by certain constraints, right? So the light bulb is bounded by the constraints of um, physics, uh, electricity, right? And a lot of the things we know in that particular arena. That is not to say that scientific answers are always the same. They are really constantly changing, um, sometimes to minor degrees. So for instance, you know, when Darwin published um, this theory of natural selection in 1859, we really haven't changed it all that much. Uh, we've added to it. There was a lot of things Darwin didn't know, which we're going to investigate in this particular lecture series. But, um, you know, the, the theory has changed slightly in terms of how we understand it. And, and of, of course, in terms of as we'll see with early evolutionary theory, kind of underlying racist implications and, and things like that. 
ethnocentrism, right? Those tend to be in a lot of these early theories. So we wanna take that out and make it less biased as well. Um, but understand that, that science changes over time. And as new evidence is presented, scientific consensus will change as well. Um, now, some people who are opposed to certain scientific things see that as a flaw, but that's actually a very important part of science. We have to, as critical thinkers, be able to look at new evidence and change our perceptions on particular topics. As long as that evidence is measurable, empirically observable, bounded, right? And, and consistent, replicable is actually something I'm missing from this slide, replicable. You can get it over and over again, same results or within a margin of error. Now, um, I gave you an article that is about um, you know, creationism and the difficulty that people who are religious may have in accepting and understanding concepts of evolution. And I hope what you took away from that article is that these two ideas are not mutually exclusive. You can be both, right? I have um, Mormon anthropologists, friends, right? Uh, Christian anthropologists, friends, you know, uh, we're not all atheists, right? Or agnostics, most of us are, but um, you know, you can have both. And it's because as the article lays out for you, well, questions of God are not scientific. They're not answerable scientifically. They're not bounded. They're not measurable scientifically. And they don't really change, right? God's plan idea has been the same answer to all human questions for thousands of years now, right? Um, that doesn't help us uh, solve new crises. It doesn't help us understand um, crises like disease, for instance. Um, it doesn't help us develop solutions. It doesn't mean it's an irrelevant answer, right? It's just a, an answer for a different reason, right? A more philosophical answer, a greater understanding of our place in life and where we go and the questions that we can't answer scientifically, like what happens to us after we die. So I hope that what we can kind of do moving forward is apply the scientific method um, to the things that we understand and uh, to things that we're trying to understand this particular class, but also maintain our personal ideologies and belief systems separate from that. So let's look briefly at evolutionary theory. Um, you know, when we hear the word evolution or you hear the phrase natural selection, everybody thinks of Charles Darwin, right? But um, people had thought about and surmised evolution long, long, long before Darwin. Even his own father, Erasmus Darwin, um, had a theory of evolution. So he's not the, to explain evolution. So, so Darwin is by no means the first person. He's simply the first person to have actual evidence to support his theory. Um, so what I thought we would do is go back in time, right? Um, and look at all the incremental bits of, of understanding and theory related to evolution that ultimately inspired Darwin's theory of natural selection. So um, concepts of evolution, um, explanations of evolution, outlines of evolution are found in ancient um, texts and scriptures all around the world, especially in Arabia, um, China, and India. Um, so we have seen this far, thousands of years ago in human history. Now, um, in the Middle Ages, we have this period of time, some kind, sometimes called the Dark Ages, approximately 500 you know, to about 1300 years ago or so, where um, Christianity ruled, the Catholic Church ruled Europe, it ruled the large world, essentially, um, and you went along with that. And what Catholicism said at the time was that God put everything on earth exactly at how, how it is, and it's never changed. Um, and that theory was called the fixity of species. So during this period of time, it's sometimes called the dark ages because of quote unquote, lack of scientific innovation. That's actually not true. Um, there is uh, quite a few important innovations that occurred during this time. Um, and so I don't use that phrase, the dark ages, but it, it, it was a slow time because, um, you know, to act against the church, to act against the fixity of species, you would be a heretic, you could um, be jailed, exiled, or even put to death. Um, and so there wasn't a lot going on necessarily. Um, now, during this time, this idea of the fixity of species was stagnant but also complicated because there was lots of evidence around us, fossils especially, that clearly showed that other forms of life have existed that currently don't exist, or other forms of life that look very similar to living forms of life are being found. 
but they don't exist anymore. So, um, you know, lots of evidence is piling up during this time against this idea of the fixity of species. And ultimately we reach a period of human history called the scientific revolution. Um, this is a time where that freedom to speak and to act scientifically was beginning to expand. Um, and some of the greatest kind of discoveries are, are created or are done during this time by people like Galileo and Copernicus, right? Um, Galileo was able to um, confirm that the earth was not flat, which was what people uh, during the middle ages believed. And let me say that again, the earth is not flat, it's round. Okay, so flat earthers, you're, you know, if you're in here, I don't know uh, if you are going to like the rest of this class. Um, the earth is not flat, right? And Galileo didn't need any fancy techniques um, or technology to be able to figure that out. In fact, if you're interested, um, the Huntington Library has an evolutionary and science section, like a museum with uh, like super cool, just first, first edition books all over the walls um, of you know, major scientific discoveries. Um, like the origin of species by Darwin, um, but also all of the inventions that a lot of these early scientists used um, that were super simple, right? Um, to prove that the earth is not flat um, and that the earth revolves around the sun. Christians also believed that um, the uh, sun revolved around the earth, right? Because we are egocentric. We think we're the center of everything, um, but that's actually not the case. Um, Copernicus was able to prove that very easily as well without any crazy advanced technology. Um, so this is a big, important time starting in the early 1500s, where we're starting to um, really develop a much more critical scientific mind outside of the church. And that is going to lay the groundwork for many scientific theorists moving forward. So I want to look at a few of the theorists that inspired the theory of natural selection for Darwin. And, and do keep in mind that um, while a lot of these things were, let's say, while scientists are now working more objectively using the scientific method, the large majority of the people that we're working at, looking at, we're still quite religious. Um, we're very tied to the Catholic Church. We're priests, even, um, you know, or living in monasteries um, who were actually attempting to prove the fixity of species, but ultimately disproved it. Um, you know, so these are not major out of the box thinkers per se, but people who are using, um, you know, discovery and the scientific method ultimately to disprove, you know, some of their own beliefs. So let's start with Carl Linnaeus. You're probably familiar with Linnaeus. If, if you've taken a biology class before, you may know of the Linnaean taxonomy. Um, in the 1700s, Carl Linnaeus was the first person to um, propose that organisms were related to each other. And I know this kind of sounds silly in the world that we live in today, right? That you can look at two organisms and say, wow, like a wolf and a dog and say, hmm, they're similar, right? Here are the things that they share. They must be related to each other. Um, and Linnaeus created this taxonomy or a way of categorizing animals um, or, or living things into um, increasingly narrow, um, and unique divisions. So the largest division in a taxonomy that you can be a part of is the domain, right? Eukaryote or prokaryote. So basically bacteria and everything else. But then these, these um, taxonomic categories get smaller and smaller and smaller. So the example that we're looking at, kingdom is the next one, we're kingdom animal. Then phylum chordata, then class mammal. Now all mammals are chordates and all chordates are animals and all animals are eukaryotes, right? So there, you, you have to be, you're kind of increasingly narrowing the unique traits of a particular group. Um, now in animals, for instance, animals um, digest their food and they move around, right? A couple minor things that make them different from other organisms, other kingdoms. But not all animals are chordatas. Now chordata means that you have a spinal cord. So that is a unique group. Now, not all um, chordatas are mammals, right? There's uh, fish, right, that have, uh, and birds that have um, spinal columns, but that are not mammals. So mammal is just one branch of chordata. And mammals 
um, are primarily, there's a few things that make mammals unique, but the name mammal comes from mammary, right? Breastfeeding children. Um, that's the class. Now we go to order. In this case, um, in the red fox example I'm showing you here, this is carnivore. Now, not all mammals are carnivores, right? Um, but carnivores are a unique group. And we get more narrow and more narrow until we get to the smallest taxonomic unit, and that is the species. Um, and the genus species distinction is probably the most important part of the taxonomy um, that we still use today. Linnaeus actually got a ton of stuff wrong. He had initially categorized things, plants, for instance, just by their sexual reproductive abilities. Um, that is, you know, and a lot of his early research is, is quite irrelevant today in terms of how he categorized things. Um, but the Linnaean taxonomy is still accurate. And we use what's called binomial nomenclature um, to name all species on this planet still today. And you'll do this a few times throughout the class. So just pay attention here for a second. Um, all animals, well, all organisms have a common name, right? Elephant in this case, and then a scientific name, um, Loxodonta africana. Now the genus, right, is on the left. The genus refers to um, a series of species that are closely related enough, right, share enough biological and chromosomal similarities that they may be able to procreate. Now that's a controversial statement, but we'll see why um, later on in the class. But this is the, you know, other members of your genus, which we're going to meet. So we are Homo sapiens. We're going to meet Homo neanderthal. We're going to meet Homo denisovan, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo florensiensis, um, uh, you know, Homo longi, Homo naledi. All of these are species in the genus Homo, many of which we likely mated with. Um, we absolutely mated with because we, we have them in our DNA, which we'll come back to later on in the semester. But those are members of the same genus. Now, species is the most unique. Um, and smallest category that you can be a part of. Um, and really historically, the thing that differentiated species is their ability to reproduce. So members of a single species should, should hypothetically not be able to reproduce with members of a different species, even if they're in the same genus. But as we're going to learn, that's not the case. And we do see that happen um, successfully in a, a, a lot of evolutionary theory or a lot of evolutionary examples. But for the sake of this class, um, when you see uh, the scientific name, right? Ours is Homo sapiens. It's going to be italicized with the genus capitalized and the uh, species in a lowercase. But I will probably use more common names. Um, another example will be chimp, right? Chimpanzee is the common name. The scientific name is pantroglodytes. So we will absolutely use binomial nomenclature throughout the class. You'll have to write it up in some of your assignments. So just let me know if there's any confusion as to how that works. One of the next theorists that was incredibly important to Darwin's work was Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. Um, and Lamarck was one of the first researchers to propose a correlation between environment and and physical traits. Um, and he proposed this uh, in his work in the 1800s. Now, again, he was very wrong in many ways. Um, his giraffe example is the most famous and you're kind of seeing that here. On the left, original short necked ancestor. This giraffe in attempt to reach a trees that are getting taller and taller over time is just stretching and stretching its neck until it ultimately has the, the, you know, the giraffe neck that we know today. Now, what Lamarck was suggesting is that the giraffe's long neck evolved to reach tall trees, to reach food. So that's an environment trait correlation. That is exactly true, right? One of the reasons that the neck is so long is to take advantage of these resources that most other species all other species on the ground, at least, are not going to be able to reach. That's a food resource for them, right? But how it happens is different than what Lamarck said. Lamarck believed that this is something that could happen in a single generation, that we could do this to ourselves, we could willfully stretch our necks, and then as a result of that, our babies would also have long necks. And that's how the giraffe uh, came to be as we know it. Um, as we move forward in the class, you'll see the many flaws in that particular theory. And if I were to just present the example of, you know, I'm, I'm covered up right now, but I have quite a few tattoos. And if I were to ask you this question, if I were to have a child, um, would my baby come out tattooed? 
I hope you know the answer is no, right? Um, and the answer is no, because uh, you know things that we do to our bodies in our lifetime um, are not going to be passed down to our children. Um, to pass traits down to our children, there have to be changes in the sex cells. So it's certainly not going to be something that we can do. And you know, by the way, you also can't just stretch your neck. Um, you know, we're, we're born, we're predisposed to a certain number of vertebrae. Our DNA determines the size, range, depth, density of those vertebrae. And that's all you get. You can't make more. You can't um, elongate the ones that you have. Um, and so his theory, his perception was incorrect, but he did lay some important groundwork. And that is a new scientific um, reality that animals look the way they do because of their environment. This is going to be crucial. Next, I thought we would take a look at a couple geological theorists. Um, the first being Georges Cuvier, who was interested in extinction. Um, and in the late 1700s, Georges Cuvier was um, a devout uh, Christian who really wanted to prove uh, the theory of the, of the fixity of species uh, by explaining fossils, because fossils were a huge piece of evidence in opposition to the fixity of species. And in the 1700s, I mean, you know, living in LA, everything's been excavated. We don't really run into a lot of fossils, right? But, you know, a few hundred years ago, you're walking around kicking rocks and you could run into a Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? Or a mammoth. I mean, they're just laying there, right? They haven't been excavated yet. So people are coming in contact with this very obvious evidence in opposition to the fixity of species. And Cuvier thought that he could explain that away with the theory of catastrophism. And so what Cuvier suggested was that God created life as it is, right? So the fixity of species is accurate. Um, but then for whatever reason, destroyed that life with a catastrophic event, right? Um, like Noah's flood, and then um, would rebuild and would create new species. So in this case, even though fossils of other species existed, um, it didn't disprove the fixity of species because God would wipe those out and then start fresh. Um, species didn't evolve. They were just wiped out and the new ones were placed here by God. Now, of course, from a scientific perspective, we don't accept that um, or acknowledge that as an explanation. But catastrophism is a geological theory because catastrophic events do cause evolution to occur. Um, and we're going to see actually the catastrophic event that happened 75 million years ago, which is an asteroid impact that's kind of being um, shown in this image right here. Without this catastrophic event, we primates would not exist. D uh, dinosaurs would probably still be ruling this planet. Um, and so it was a result of this catastrophic event that caused major climactic and geological changes around the world that then paved the way for primates to start evolving. So catastrophic events um, and catastrophism is a field of geological research today, not the way Cuvier described it, um, but in a sense that these events, these major events kind of force evolution to occur because whatever is left after the catastrophic event is probably going to have to adapt to new circumstances. Now, while catastrophism explains evolution um, to some degree, Charles Lyell, the father of geology, um, would have said and still says that really most of evolution happens as a result of very small gradual changes. And in the early 1800s, Lyell created the theory or coined the term uniformitarianism, not the church, not a Unitarian, uniformitarianism, which is the geological idea or the geological theory and principle essentially that small incremental geological changes cause environments to change, cause climates to change. Um, they add up over time. And you're seeing um, kind of the cycle of geological events that are happening in this picture. Um, so we have um, uh, magma under the earth's surface, which is breaking up you know, rock that's being pushed down in there and then it's spewing it back up, right? Or it's causing mountains to be created. And then the rain and the weather is kind of breaking the minerals that make up the mountain down and putting it back into the ocean. And then it sinks to the bottom of the ocean and it ultimately goes back underground and comes back up. Um, you know, these complex processes cause the earth's shape to change. They cause ocean currents to shift. They cause heat and cold to be redistributed differently. 
all of which is going to slowly cause the organisms in those areas to change um, uniformitarianism. So I will introduce a little bit of uh, geology to you um, later on in the semester uh, in more in depth. But for this discussion, just kind of be familiar with the uniformitarianism idea, right? Slow, gradual changes cause the environment to change, which means that the organisms are going to slowly change with that environment as well. Now, the last theorist that I want to introduce to you was probably the most influential in Charles Darwin's work, and that was Thomas Malthus. Um, Thomas Malthus, you may know from a political science class or a sociology class, Malthus was a pessimist, you know, by my own heart, and he was interested in, in population. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he uh, published an essay on the principle of population that focused on overpopulation of our species and said that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. That's actually the, the simplified version of that, actually from the original book. Malthus was talking about human populations. He was talking about um, you know, this, this pessimistic idea that people need to be killed off, right? That we need to have disasters, we need to have um, diseases, we need to have things that wipe out large masses of the human population in order to regulate so that you know, there's enough resources for us all to survive because there never are, right? And that's essentially what Malthus was saying. The power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. But this crosses other species. Essentially what Malthus was saying is there will never be enough food for everybody in a single species. And that's important, right? Because who is going to get that food? Who is going to get that food? Who is going to survive? That is what truly inspired Charles Darwin because, you know, Darwin was an interesting um, person. He was a wealthy man, came from a wealthy family, failed at, you know, infinite things throughout his life. He tried to be a medical doctor, but he couldn't stand the sight of blood. Um, you know, he passed out watching a, a surgery of a child, um, you know, pre-anesthetics. He tried to be a priest. He failed at that. Um, and ultimately his, his, father, Erasmus Darwin, got him a job um, on a beagle voyage that started in 1831. Now, Darwin's primary responsibilities were to be what's called the naturalist. So um, as they landed in each spot that you see on this map, he would get out, he'd explore, and he'd collect samples, live, dead, fossils, geological things, right? Um, and, and the whole boat was just filled with kind of this, all these samples that he was collecting. Um, and at night, his primary responsibility was to be company to the captain. The captain, of course, would not um, lower himself to work with people in the steerage, et cetera. And so he was kind of the person that the captain would have dinner with that night and they'd have intellectual conversations, et cetera. And um, this was a five-year journey and the evidence that Darwin collected would ultimately support his theory of natural selection, which explains evolution and is the first real theory to um, have the evidence there to support it um, that explains how evolution occurs. And we're going to see what that evidence looked like. And there's a film that I suggest that you watch that's in the uh, notes here called What Darwin Never Knew. Um, but what Darwin was collecting was um, he was finding large fossils. He found huge sloths, huge turtles, right? Clearly animals that didn't exist anymore, but looked a lot like animals that existed, like the modern sloth. Um, you know, he found um, all sorts of, of evidence among the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador that would be the most important, like that locals could tell you exactly where a particular tortoise or finch bird came from based on the shape of their neck shell or beak. Um, and that is because each one of those tortoises or birds, finch beaks, right, evolved in a specific island for a specific type of food. This came together for Darwin, right? So in, you know, as he's collecting this evidence and he's on this boat and he's analyzing it and he's racking his head, he's like, okay, so um, obviously animals change. Obviously organisms change over time. But he didn't quite understand the driving force, what's causing change. Now, interestingly, during his time, this Victorian era, there was a huge emphasis on dog breeding. I mean, Victorians loved dogs and they were breeding all sorts of 
um, specific types of dogs like the Whippet. Um, you know, the Whippet is a small dog that's meant for hunting rabbits. And, um, you know, prior to the Whippet's existence, there were greyhounds, which are fast, but very big um, and don't really have a hunting instinct. And then there were terriers. Um, there were hunting dogs that had a great hunting instinct, but maybe weren't as fast. And rabbits are fast. Right. So during this time, people would take the terrier and they'd made it with the greyhound and you'd get the fast trade of the greyhound and the hunting senses of the terrier. And that's the whippet. And the whippet was used to then hunt and, and help in the support of hunting rabbits. Now, Darwin was reflecting on that because clearly we can control how the children look of a next generation by mating, right, by choosing the traits that we wanted in these dogs we were able to create a new dog. So we can do this ourselves. We can make this happen with human intervention, but it also appears to be happening in the wild on its own. What's the driving force? And as he is thinking about this information on this five-year journey and looking at all of this evidence, he's reading Thomas Malthus's work and he's going back to this quote, the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence for man. And a light bulb goes off and he comes to this answer. What's the driving force in the wild for these animals changes? And it's competition for resources. There are not enough resources for every individual in a single species. So the individuals that have traits that will get them those resources. Those are the ones that survive and they have babies who have those resources and or, excuse me, those traits to get those resources. And so those traits will increase over time, right? That is what natural selection is. And that is where, that is exactly what Darwin wrote in On the Origin of Species in 1859. He focused on a force of natural selection um, for evolution. Um, primarily on competition for resources and the predator-prey relationship, which we're going to investigate um, as we move forward in the lecture. Now, Darwin's theories are still extremely relevant today and are really not controversial to any extent, um, but we have added a lot. We've added a lot of things that Darwin didn't consider. And, you know, Darwin didn't uh, and said and, and actually blanketly stated and on the origin of species that he didn't want to comment on human evolution. So that wasn't even on his radar. So we will be, you know, including a whole host of things that quote unquote Darwin never knew. And um, there's a film, I included the link at the bottom of the slide. You can also Google the title, but it's really, it's two hours. So I don't show it in the class, but it's, it, it'll really take you from the beginning to the end of this class in two hours um, and give you some great visuals. If you're interested in it, you get to learn a little bit more about Darwin, how he developed these theories. And then of course, all the things he had no idea we're actually involved in this process that we've discovered um, over the last 200 years or so. We're going to move forward um, with that. I'm gonna end this particular video here. And when we come back, um, I'm going to look at more forces of evolution. So Darwin understood and talked about natural selection, but he didn't necessarily address other things that we know today cause evolution to occur. So that's what we are going to look at um, in the next uh, uh, segment of this lecture series the forces of evolution. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise I will see you for our next video.